Video 8, the simple linear regression model. This is where we get into one of my favorite little topics, and that is the question of causality. Whilst it's nice for us to be able to pick up patterns in the ways in which one variable might connect to another, we'd like to do a little bit more than that. We'd like to be able to say that if you change this variable over here, it's going to have an impact on that variable over there. So if you increase people's access to education, then it's going to, for example, improve their incomes. Or if you spend more on advertising, you're going to get a bigger market share. Or if you uh, can figure out what are the factors that are causing the costs of your production to be so high, then you can do something about reducing costs. Uh, if you can improve the quality of your labor, reduce the number of mistakes, then you can increase output. So those are the kinds of a causes B or X causes Y types of questions, which are very important for so many aspects of business and uh, the economy and uh, social sciences for that matter. So we really need to figure out how we can use data to help us with answering questions about causality. Now, that's a big topic and we're not really going to do a whole lot on that yet, but we're going to start laying the foundations for it. And the foundations come from the idea of building a model that relates a variable X and a variable Y together. So last video, when we were thinking about correlation and cause, uh, correlation and uh, covariance, we talked about a scatter plot, which just is a visual representation of the relationship between two variables such as X and Y. Uh, in this case, education and wages. Um, what we're going to do is try and turn that into a model by imagining that through that set of dots, we could put a line, and that line is what's referred to as kind of like a trend line, or the jargon we'll get to in a moment, a regression line which sort of summarizes a model of relationship between those two factors. Here's the line that you'd get, um, which would be the, the best line that you could fit through that data, and we'll talk a bit later about what we mean by the best line. So this tells us that for a given level of uh, education, this is what you could predict a person's income might actually be, so given by this, this equation here. So, if a person has one extra level, an extra year of education, then we can say that they're going to earn an extra $5,182, for example, is one of the ways in which there's a useful kind of a statement. So that little uh, equation there is what we might think about as a simple model that relates X and Y together. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from the idea of the equation of a line, which you've come across uh, in math study before in the past, I'm sure. So let me just remind you of a few things. We, the equation for a line is given by this expression right here. And that's got two components to it. The first component is what we refer to as beta zero. That's the intercept. And that in, visually is what we get at this particular point here, which is the point at which we cross the y axis. So it's the point at which uh, when uh, x equals 0, what value does y actually take? So in this case, uh, the, the intercept is, is given to us there. The slope, in the jargon of uh, high school mathematics, is called the rise over the run, is basically telling us what happens to y as you change x by one unit. So if this is how much x changes by between this point and this point, and y changes by that much, then the change in y on the change in x, or dy dx in differentiation terms, is the slope. So in the example that we had there, that tells us what the impact would be of an extra year of education on your income, for example. So there's a bunch of situations where just being able to tell us what an estimate of that slope is is, is very useful. Okay, so that's the equation for a line that we're going to make use of in deciphering uh, this particular model. So we write the model like this in uh, mathematical form. It's got a few things about it which we'll highlight. But, okay, first of all, we've got y, which we call a dependent variable. It's a thing that you're trying, it depends on x, so that's why it's dependent variable related to x, the independent variable. In terms of sort of changing the world, y is a thing that we might want to have some influence over. So y is some kind of outcome. Could be the profit of the company or it could be the number of people who are unemployed, or it could be the uh, uh, the rate of poverty in a country, or anything like that. So it's something that you want to have some influence over, but actually most of the time you can't actually directly control Y. What you can control is X. So X is kind of 
the the variable which you have some influence over that you think might and you and you you hope that by changing x you can have some influence over y. So y is the sales of the business, x is your marketing expenditure. And you think that by spending more on marketing, we're going to increase our sales. The parameters that define this model are the intercept and the slope, and we refer to those as beta 0 and beta 1 because these are what's called population parameters. They're the overall quantities. Now, this is only a model, so it's not going to give you the exact relationship between x and y, and so we kind of acknowledge that by reminding ourselves that the truth out there also includes an error term, and that error term has got the notation E sub i. So in terms of if I can just draw a diagram to capture this, here's x and y, and here's the line, and here's a dot. The error is the, the distance between a particular dot and that line. So here might be a, a point here. So the actual relationship between x and y is defined by this particular point here, but the model predicts that much there. So that gap is what we refer to as an error associated with the model's prediction for that value of y. In this case, this is the actual x and y, and this is what the model predicts, so that length of that line there is the error associated with that prediction. After all, a model is not the truth, it's only an approximation to the truth. So if you tell me how much education someone's had, the model can predict how much income I think they earn, but of course it's not going to give me a perfect prediction, and that error tells me about how big the error is in any given case. Now, that's the idea of our model. There's a one thing that makes it uh, a little bit different in reality, which is that we don't actually know the true intercept in the slope with a set of data, or with, in, in terms of the overall relationship. What we have is a set of data from which we can estimate the intercept and the slope. So to distinguish between the true intercept and slope, which we don't know, and the intercept and slope that we calculate from our sample, we put a little hat on our intercept and slope values. So the true intercept and the true slope are given by beta naught and beta 1. The estimated intercept and the estimated slope are given by beta naught hat and beta 1 hat. And then likewise, we have the predicted value of y given by the model. I'm going to cross that out because that's what the predicted value of y would be. And the error for a given value would be given as the true value of y minus the predicted value of y. Excuse my bad uh, handwriting, maybe you get the idea. Okay, so there's a relationship between those two there. Now, we'll, we'll see that a little bit more later. Okay. Now we've got a bit of mathematics we're going to have to do to work out how we use some data to estimate those values of the intercept and the slope. And uh, um, oh, here we are. Here's a better example of the uh, the dots I was drawing on the previous page. So here's the red line represents what the model predicts it, the uh, value of y would be for a given value of x. The actual value is uh, the dot. So the difference between what the truth is y i and what the model predicts, why i hat, is the error. In this case, that's the size of the error for that dot. There's another error for this dot, for example, which is the vertical distance from that dot to the line, and so on. So that distance there is the error in that case. Okay, and there's one of those for each of the dots. All right, so that's what our models are all about. Okay, we're still stuck with this problem of how, given a set of data, do we actually choose the values of the intercept and the slope. And there's a little bit of mathematics here that suggests to us that the way we do this is by finding the values of the intercept and the slope which fit the best to the data, so which give us values which are as close as possible to the true values. So remembering that we've got a line through some data, we've got a whole lot of dots all around the place. Some lines are going to be better than others. Some lines will, this is a good example where this is probably the best line, but I could imagine drawing another line like that, which is not as good because it's not as close to the dots that have actually got that line. The more steep line in this particular case does a lot better job of getting close to the true dots. The flat line is not as good, it's got quite a 
few points at which it's a long way from the truth. So being a long way from the, from the dots is really about saying you've got big errors. So the goal is to choose the line which makes the errors as small as possible. And choice of line boils down to a choice of intercept and slope. Once you know the intercept once you, and the slope, you can draw the line. So our goal is to choose the beta naught and beta 1 values that minimize the errors. And we want the errors to be minimized across all the possible values of all the data. So we, we average those by adding them up. But of course, we, the errors sometimes are positive, sometimes are negative. So before we add them, we square them and add them up. So the model, the formulation of the intercept and the slope is basically given by uh, the value which minimizes the sum of squared errors. Now, the sum of squared errors is a quadratic function of the intercept. So what we do is we try to, you can imagine, trying different values of the intercept until you get to the, to the value of the intercept that makes the sum of squared errors as small as possible, and that is your best intercept. And you do the same thing for the slope, and out spits the best line that fits through the data. That's sort of a bit of an application of some of the high school mathematics that you learned about minimization of functions. Here's the function, which is the sum of squared errors. We want to minimize that by choosing the appropriate value of the intercept and the slope. And in turn, what that's doing is essentially choosing the line that gives you the smallest average or sum of squared errors. Right, that's the mathematics of it. In Excel, it's dead easy. You just have to go to uh, data analysis under the tools menu and select regression, put in the appropriate range of Y values and X values, and out spits uh, some regression output, which looks like that. Now, I'll let you in your uh, homework and tutorial work figure out just the mechanics of doing that, but you, the uh, information is quite straightforward. You've just got to think a little bit carefully about some of the choice of things like whether you tick that labels box, where you send your output and so on. But essentially it's just about saying this column A is where the Y data is and this column B is where the X data is. Once you get the output, then the key things that you need here, there's a whole lot of stuff that you'll over the next uh, couple of months learn what all this means, but the key things that you've got out of this are your intercept and slope estimates. So that's the value of the intercept and that's the value of slope, the beta naught hat and the beta one hat, which fits this data the best, gives you the smallest sum of squared errors. So what we've now got is a way of getting the line for a given set of data and putting it through uh, the data to give you an interesting relationship. So this is where we can say, for example, something about the impact of education on income. This says if you add another year to your education, the model predicts that you'll earn another $5,597 or about $5,600 worth of income on average. We'll talk a bit more about the details of how to interpret this later, but that's the general idea. We won't think too much effect about the intercept being negative. That says if you've got no education, then you're going to be earning minus $44,000. That doesn't sound particularly realistic. We won't worry about that for now. That's something for us to, again, think about a bit later. Okay, but in simple terms, what we're doing is just a descriptive tool to summarize the relationship between X and Y with, with a straight line. Now, we're going to now see that there is actually a number of other ways which uh, we, we can make use of this regression tool in Excel to estimate other quantities. So, for example, you might be interested in estimating just the mean of some data. So far, you've done that with just a simple function in Excel called equals average, equals average of whatever. That's fine if all you want to do is calculate the mean, but sometimes you want to do a bit more than that. You want you want to have a bit more information than just the average. Uh, you want to know something about, for example, how accurate is the estimate that the average is given you and so on. So we can do that by actually using the regression method to essentially estimate the mean rather than estimating the intercept and the slope of a line it effectively estimates a line which is a completely uh, flat line at the mean and that's the line which we refer to as as the uh, what's well, the estimate provides us with the estimate of the mean there's a few specific instructions there and again you'll get to see exactly how to do that in your tutorial uh, your uh, workshop this week so here we've done a regression where we've got no intercept but we've got a X variable which is just equal to a constant. So effectively what this has done is estimated the mean. So the mean of our data is $33,161 and there's some other things here which we can use which is very handy. So this says the average income of all 4,692 people in our sample is 33,161. 
Now these these couple of slides may not make a lot of sense to you. First of all, why did you make me calculate the average in such a complicated way? I could have just gone equals average and got the same answer. Fair point. And then why is it that when I do this weird regression that you're describing here, it gives me the mean? Now in both of those things, I just want you to trust me that that's a sensible thing for us to do. It will become obvious in a few weeks or even a few more videos exactly why we want to do things that way. It gives us a unifying way to estimate a whole lot of quantities of interest, not just a line with an intercept and a slope. We might, in this case, want to estimate a mean and do things with it. We can use the same piece of Excel uh, to, to, to achieve that outcome and, and there's some benefits to that. And here's another example. This time I'm not interested in estimating the mean of a set of data, I'm interested in estimating a proportion. I want to know, for example, the probability or the proportion of people who are working if they're females or uh, working if they're not females. Um, and so to do that, I need to uh, estimate the proportion. So I can just count up how many there are who are working and divide that by how many in total. So if there's 100 data points and I've got 75 people working, then the probability of being a worker is 0.75 sort of easy to do intuitively, so um, you don't really need the computer to do it if it's that simple, but what you do want to do is go take the, extend that work a little bit further uh, later on, which again is what I'm going to trust, ask you to trust me about for now, which I don't want to just come up with an estimate of the proportion, like 75%, but I perhaps want some interval of certainty around that, you know, is it 75% or is it 77% or is it 72% or 73%? So I want some kind of estimate of accuracy, and by using this particular regression tool in Excel, that comes out to me quite easily. So we'll see how that works in practice a bit later. But for now, we can. the main point I want to show you is that by a simple regression, uh, I can estimate that proportion, and here's exactly what I get there. So this gives me an estimate of this particular case, I'm estimating both the proportion of females working and the proportion of people who are not females working. And the intercept gives me the proportion of people who are not females, 0.75, and the slope gives me the proportion of people who are females, or sorry, the difference between the, the, the proportion working for females versus males. So, uh, proportion of males working is 0.75, proportion of females working is 0.75 minus 0.4167, so that's uh, 0.33. Now again, I'm just talking you through this quite quickly, and there's a bit about this that I haven't explained in detail. You'll need to work through this in your homework and in your workshop as well to really be able to make sense of that. For now, just take my word for it that that's the way in which you can estimate these kinds of quantities. Now last of all in this particular video, what I'm going to do is just remind you of where we got these estimates of the uh, intercept and the slope from in regression terms. And we got it by uh, applying a bit of mathematics to the formulas to produce for us the estimate, uh, the, 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 uh, the values of the, the formulas for the, the intercept and the slope which minimize the sum of squared errors. So let me take you back through the intuition behind that, and then you see here a little bit of the mathematics of it. The sum of squared errors, if I take you back, is the best way of describing how accurate our model is. If you've got a good model, a great good line, it'll get nice and close to the dots. If it's not a very good choice of line, it'd be, in other words, the intercept and the slope are not the best, you'll get a big difference between the actual data, the dots, and what the model predicts, the red line. So the errors are things that you want to make as small as possible. Sometimes the errors are positive, like this case. Sometimes they're negative, like this case, because the actual value is below the estimate. So y minus the model estimate is negative. So if you want to make the errors as small as possible, you've got to take account of the fact that some errors are positive and some are negative. So what you do is you, you square all the errors so that everything becomes positive, and then you add them up. So for a given possible line, I could calculate all the errors, square them and add them up, and that would give me the sum of squared errors for that line. Now I could do that for another line and get a different sum of squared errors, and hunt around for the best possible line that gives me the sum of squared errors which is as small as possible. That's what I want to do. Now rather than doing that by trial and error, where I try all sorts of lines and see whether or not they give me the best, I can use a bit of mathematics to derive formulas for calculating that 
line in an optimal way, a line which gives me the smallest possible sum of squared areas. So the mathematics starts with this thing here. The error itself is the difference between the truth and what the model predicts. So that's the y, and that's the y hat. And the model predicts what's on the red line, which is this amount here. Given a particular intercept and slope, that's what you predict the value of y would be. So the difference between those two is the error. You square it, and then you add them up over all possible errors. So when you do that, you can see that the sum of squared errors depends upon the intercept and slope. Different choice of intercept, different choice of slope, different sum of squared errors. So we then apply our mathematics here to differentiate that formula for the sum of squared errors with respect to the intercept and the slope. And that's what we get these two expressions for here. So you'll see a little bit more detail for this in the lecture notes, but this is your starting point here. Imagine taking this line here and differentiating that with respect to beta naught. It's a little bit complicated looking, but there's a squared term, so you've got to apply the chain rule from your differentiation in high school to be able to work out what that looks like. And then separately, we'll differentiate with respect to beta 1, and you'll get a slightly different expression in each case, because they don't come in totally in exactly the same way, but quite similar. So then you'll get those expressions there. The minimum of some function is found by setting the slope equal to zero. So we've taken the differential, which is the slope. Now we set that slope to zero. So we take these quantities here and we make them equal to zero in each case to get the minimum. And once we've made them equal to zero, then we can play around with algebra to our heart's content until we rearrange them and get an equation that says beta naught equals and beta one hat equals, beta naught hat equals, beta one hat equals. So there's a few steps in that. And with a bit of work, they end up with these two formulas here, beta naught hat equals that, beta one hat equals that. So that's how we end up producing those estimates, the mathematics of it. As I say, there's a few of the gaps filled in in the lecture notes. The purpose here is just to give the intuition for what that maths is actually doing. Just applying some of the algebra of function minimization that you learned about in high school. Okay, so that's a very brief overview of uh, simple regression and its applications and some of the tricks that we use to apply simple regression to do things like estimating the mean and proportions. And as I say, some of this won't make a lot of sense to you just yet, but hang in there over the coming uh, videos. Hopefully you'll see why we do things the way we do. Thanks.